So you should be nearing the end of working problems in chapter 21 if you want to stay ahead. And you definitely want to stay ahead because everything in carbonyochemistry builds upon what we've already learned. And that's seven weeks of carbonyochemistry, so you don't want to get behind. Uh, any questions before we get started? All right. So we left off last time talking about Grignard's rea Grignard reagents. And we asked the question, do Grignard's react with carboxylic acids? And we said no, because um, the first thing that's going to happen is an acid-base reaction to deprotonate the carboxylic acid. And the Grignard is not powerful enough to add into the carbox carboxylate. Okay, so, but we said lithium will. So this is what it looks like when you use lithium instead. All right, so same first step as a Grignard. I don't know why it's doing that sort of thing there. That's annoying, right? Okay, so first step here. We're going to deprotonate the carboxylic acid, right? So we grab the acidic hydrogen and then we push electrons up onto oxygen to give us a carboxylate. Grignards are not strong enough to add to a carboxylate, but lithium reagents are stronger nucleophiles and they are strong enough to add to a carboxylate. So that's what's going to happen. Arrow's going to come from the carbon-lithium bond. We're going to attack the carbonyl carbon, kick electrons up onto oxygen. So notice I'm throwing electron, uh, lone pairs, electron pairs on the oxygen. Let's take a look at the um, tetrahedral intermediate we get and see if we have any leaving groups. Do we have any leaving groups? No. Tetrahedral intermediate has no leaving groups. So therefore, it's going to stop here. And then what happens is you add water in a second step. And you're going to protonate both of those oxygens. I'm not going to show the arrow pushing for that, but you're going to protonate both of those oxygens. You can do that. This compound right here is um, typically unstable. It's a functional group that's a new one that we're going to learn in chapter 21, and it's called a hydrate. It's an unstable hydrate. In fact, we will talk about um, unstable hydrates in, on, in Monday's lecture, so real soon you'll know what that is. And so um, that's why I have it in brackets. And it's kind of like an enol keto tautomerization. This is a hydrate. And, it, and what, it, what it does is it converts into a, it, into a ketone. So we have a long arrow. It's not a tautomerization. It's something different. But it's going to easily convert. In the presence of a trace of acid or base, it will convert um, into a ketone. So notice that overall transformation. This overall transformation converts a carboxylic acid into a ketone. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, so far, the, the, that's the only way that we, can ha we have to do this. So result. Synthesis of ketones from carboxylic acids. So may want to have that on one of your index cards.
way to take a carboxylic acid directly into a ketone. There's other ways to do this, but um, this is the, the, certainly the quickest, most straightforward way to do it. All right, a clever reaction using Grignard's can actually be used to synthesize carboxylic acids. Um, so, and we, and we use a Grignard for this. And so what happens is the arrow comes from the carbon-magnesium bond. We attack the carbon of, of carbon dioxide, push electrons up onto oxygen. So notice I'm throwing lone pairs on that oxygen. So there's your carboxylate. And then when you add uh, acid in the second step, and that's looking a little weird here, add acid in second step, you're going to protonate that and that's a way to make a carboxylic acid. Grignard into a carboxylic acid. Would we want to use a, a lithium reagent for this? What do you think? Yeah, we don't want to use a lithium reagent because the lithium is strong enough to add to this carboxylate. Um, so we may have side products if we use lithium. So this is um, def typically used using a Grignard. Um, in the 51 labs, I don't think they do it anymore, but they used to do a lab where they would, you would make a Grignard. And then this is really cool because um, in order for the CO2, you can just pour your Grignard right over dry ice. And it's all, you know, because it's really exothermic reaction, but it's kind of cool and you can make carboxylic acid. So I don't think they do that anymore. I think they do a different one, um, but it's a really fun reaction. So the other thing I want you to notice about this because we're building up carbon skeletons, uh, uh, if, we take, if we look at the original Grignard that we have, let's circle it. And let's follow it through. Notice that we've added on a one carbon piece. We haven't really had a way to do that before. So this adds on a one carbon piece. So if you, want to, if you have a carbon skeleton and you need to add one carbon, this could be a way to do that. Okay? So I want you to just kind of take a note of that. And, and you should be working on a carbon-carbon bond forming um, page here, and this would be on that. Adds a one carbon piece. Another way to add on a one carbon piece from a Grignard is um, use formaldehyde. Another way, if we took this, And we did step one, formaldehyde. I'm kind of squeezing this in here. I just thought of this right now. Step two, H2O. That also adds on a one carbon piece. Let me scroll down a little bit and we can add it right here. All right, so see that? Let's indicate what we started with here. Let's circle what we started with. There's that. There's that. This is also a one carbon piece. It's just in a different oxidation state. So which way you use will depend on what you want to do later if you, or what you're trying to make here. Okay? So we've got a, a two carbon piece by adding an, a, a, an epoxide and we have a one carbon piece now by adding CO2 or uh, formaldehyde. So just keep that in mind. Questions so far? Anybody? Yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I said they could be interchangeable, but um, water is not going to, if you look, if you write out the acid-base equilibrium, it's not going to be enough to protonate that. Okay, so you have a carboxylate. Let's write that out. Good question. Why I used acid instead of water? You were curious about that, right? Let's write it out. 
You know, we have acid-base equilibrium. We can always write out the acid-base equilibrium and see if that's going to be good enough. Okay, so there's our acid-base equilibrium. Carboxylic acid plus hydroxide, right? PKA, and let's change color so you can see this a little better. I, I'm adding all this extra stuff and I didn't leave myself enough room here. Um, this is a PKA about 5, correct? And this is PKA about 15. So you see how it's favored the other direction. So that's why I use acid for this one. Okay? Uh, more questions? Okay. All right, thank you for pointing it out, by the way. All right, let's summarize Grignard reagents, organolithium, and cuprate. So we're going to add a few new things here in our summary. So Grignard reagents and organolithium, extremely strong bases, powerful nucleophiles that add to um, all the types of carbonyls we talked about and epoxides. So good old epoxides, they add to epoxides. Because they're strong bases, you can't make Grignard or organolithium reagents from compounds that contain acidic hydrogens. And since organocopper reagents or cuprates are made from organolithium, you, they also can't be made from things that contain acidic hydrogens. So here's some examples of acidic hydrogens. So you, so you, you, you can't make Grignards with compounds that contain these groups. Can't make a, a Grignard yeah, organolithium. or um, organocopper reagent from um, compounds that contain these groups. Uh, easy to forget, but something that you really want to keep on your mind here. Um, in addition, there's some, we, all, we also have some more limitations because Grignards can't re, re, because Grignards react with carbonyls and epoxides. You can't make a Grignard reagent out of a compound that has a carbonyl or an epoxide in it because it will self-react. So here's possible Grignard reagents in the left-hand side. Notice we don't have any groups that are going to be re reacting. Here's impossible Grignard reagents. What's wrong with this one? It has an acidic hydrogen right here. What's wrong with this one? And that's why I have it in brackets, because you can form it, but it's going to self-react. Um, this one has a carbonyl. Grignard's attack carbonyl, so you can't make this a stable compound. This one has an epoxide. You can't make a Grignard from a compound that contains an epoxide. So you can't do epoxides, carbonyls, acidic hydrogens. We are very limited here. What's going to happen if we, t we make this? I have it in brackets. It's going to react with another molecule of itself. So that's what I mean by self-react. So arrow is going to come from the carbon magnesium bond and it will grab a hydrogen here. So you will get this compound right here. And um, Methanol. All right, the same thing happens with a, um, a Grignard that contains an epoxide. It will self-react. So it's going to come and it's going to attack the least substituted side. We're going to kick electrons up onto oxygen. So you can't stop these reactions from happening. All right, so things like that are going to happen. And that's going to react further. So I'm just, I'm just drawing that as an intermediate. That's going to react further. So we'll put that in brackets. So you can't make, so I hope I've made the point. You've you got to avoid these types of groups um, when you're uh, making Grignard reagents. Grignard and Grignard, and the other thing that I want to point out that some people try to do on tests is to react Grignard and organolithiums with alkyl halides. Conceptually, it should work. We have an electron-rich Grignard. We have an alkyl halide. It's an electrophile. Um, and so um, this is the concept here. Should work. It's definitely um, sound chemistry to, to uh, imagine that that would work. 
uh, but it doesn't work. It would be nice if it would work, but it doesn't work. There are very few examples in the literature where um, there's, people have tried to do this. It doesn't work very well. There are low yields, and there's other ways to do it. Um, so I don't want you to use it. It's not, it's not a good reaction. OK, so no. No organolithium reagents. reacting with alkyl halides. Now, the truth of the matter is that cuprates do react with alkyl halides. This is called a coupling reaction. And we are not covering that reaction. And so I don't want you using it. And, and the reason I don't want you using it is because you don't know what the limitations of the reaction are. So cuprates do work in this way that we've just shown here, uh, but I don't want you, you won't get credit if you use it on the test because you don't know what the limitations are, you don't know the conditions. We haven't talked about that reaction. So we're just not going to do any organolithium reagents with alkyl halides. All right, so, um, so basically Grignards and organolithiums go together and they have the same reactivity. Cuprates have their own reactivity. So what do cuprates do? We've already seen one reaction with cuprates. What was that? Cuprates don't react with um, carbonyls except for one carbonyl. What was that? Which one was that one? Acid chlorides. OK. So cuprates um, do react with alkyl to produce, but we're not going to be covering this, so you're not going to use it. Um, they react with epoxides, acid chlorides. And they also do 1,4 addition, which we're going to talk about in the next section. So epoxides, so cuprates. Epoxides, acid chlorides, and what we call 1,4 addition. Those are the only reactions we're going to do with cuprates. The coupling reactions, not covered in this book, not covered in this class. So epoxides, acid chlorides, let's give an example of an, an, an acid um, an epoxide reaction. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, I didn't turn my phone off. Isn't it nice to know that you're not the only one? Let's just turn that off. How about that? My kids usually know that I'm in class right now, and so they won't call me, but that, that is, um, that didn't happen this time. Okay, we're opening up the epoxide. After protonation, gives you an alcohol. So cuprates will do that. So cuprates, um, epoxides, acid chlorides, and 1,4 addition, which we're going to talk about in the next section. All right, and you know what? I, would, I do want to label this here. Don't use on exam. So we're going to move on and talk about um, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds and 1,2 versus 1,4 addition. We've seen 1,2 versus 1,4 addition. What chapter was that in? Do you remember? Chapter 16. We had kinetic and thermodynamic, right? This is the same thing. All right, so alpha beta unsaturated carbon compounds are usually reactive double bonds. The beta carbon atom is electrophilic because it shares the partial positive charge of the carbonyl carb compound through resonance. Let's just draw resonance structures for this compound, and you'll see what this is coming from. So with any carbonyl, we can take and break, break the pi bond and move electrons onto the more electronegative oxygen. Okay, and if we do that, we get um, a minor resonance structure, but a contributing structure um, nonetheless. So it looks like that. And then, um, as you can see, this part of the molecule here, you might recognize it. 
There's a, parser, there's a positive charge here, and this is an allylic cation, isn't it? All right, so whenever we have allylic cations, we can draw a resonance structure for that. So we can push electrons here. And if we do that, we get this resonance structure. So you can see that we have two electrophilic sites in this molecule because of that double bond that's conjugated. We have an electrophilic site here, we can, and that's where we can attack the carbonyl, electrophilic carbon of the carbonyl. But we can also attack here. And if we count, this is one, two, three, four. So um, if this, is the, this would be one, the one, four position, and this would be one, two. So we start counting from the oxygen, this is, would be one, two. We can attack, have nucleophiles attack here. We can also have them attack um, here. That is the beta carbon. So let's label that. So that when we have, when we're talking about carbonyls, um, alpha to the carbonyl is right here, adjacent, immediately adjacent, and then as we move out, um, it's, it's a beta. So uh, electrophilic center here. And electrophilic center here. All right, so it turns out we have two places for the nucleophile attack, and it can actually do both of those attacks. Let's look at 1-2 addition. We're most familiar with 1-2 addition. That's what we've been doing this entire chapter. In 1-2 addition, we attack the carbonyl carbon, and we move electrons up onto oxygen, just like that. So in the one two addition, we attack the carbonyl carbon just like we're used to seeing. And then after protonation, let's put hydrogens here. Sorry about that. Our product is an alcohol. And that's also a 1-2 addition. So carbonyl, attack at the carbonyl is 1-2. Or nucleophile can attack at the 1-4 position, at the beta position. And, the, and this is what that would look like. Nucleophile comes here. So pretty fancy arrow pushing. We're attacking at the beta position. We're moving electrons over and making an intermediate that has a functional group that you may recognize. If that oxygen was protonated, we would call that an enol, right? When that oxygen is deprotonated, we call that an enolate ion. Okay, so this is, there's the enol word, but eight means it's been deprotonated, enolate ion. So that's an intermediate in one, four addition, and then when we protonate, we get the nucleophile um, that is bonded to the beta position. And we regenerate the carbonyl. So if you remember back to chapter 16, the one, two product was, was that the kinetic or the thermodynamic? That was the kinetic product, and it's going to be the same thing here. One, two is kinetic, and one, four is thermodynamic. Um, it, does it look like that would be the most stable product if we're comparing um, an alcohol versus a carbonyl? What's more stable? Car carbonyl is way more stable. Okay, so that's, that's actually the thermodynamic, more stable product. That's the kinetic product. Okay, but attack at the carbonyl is always going to be faster. So we have a competition here, and when we have a competition, um, you're going to be asked to determine what the product is going to be from that competition. And so uh, as you can see here, just to summarize here, we have the nucleophile can attack the carbonyl carbon. I'm not going to finish the arrow pushing. Um, or the nucleophile can attack 1,4.
it's going to attack at the other electrophilic center, which would be right there. If it attacks in the 1, 4 position, so, so 1, 4 addition, also known as, aka, conjugate addition. Gives the more stable product. And the more stable product is always going to be the thermodynamic product. And um, over here, attacking 1, 2, so this is 1, 2 addition, is faster. It's faster to attack the carbonyl carbon. And so that's the kinetic product. Did I say? Oh, I was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's fix that. All right. So, how do we know what's going to be faster? What's how? Well, we know that what's going to be faster. The one two is faster. How do we know the product that we're going to get? It turns out that when we use the strong nucleophiles that do irreversible carbonyl addition, which is all our reagents in this chapter, right? Hydride reagents, Grignards, organolithium. Do cuprates attack the carbonyl? Only if it's an acid chloride, right? So cuprates don't attack the carbonyl. So when nucleophiles that undergo irreversible carbonyl additions are used, the carbonyl addition product is usually observed. Carbonyl addition or the 1, 2 product. These are all very strong nucleophiles. So Grignards, uh, organolithiums, uh, lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride, um, deprotonated terminal alkynes. These are all really strong nucleophiles. What they, what, and the reason they do irreversible addition is that once they've attacked, they can't come back off again. And since carbonyl addition is faster, does it make sense that we're going to get the 1, 2 product? Because they're going, to more fit, or they're going to rapidly attack the carbonyl, and boom, once they're on, they can't come back off again. So it's the 1, 2, one, two product that we're going to isolate. Um, these guys here, when nucleophiles that undergo reversible carbonyl additions, well, we haven't really talked about those yet. We'll talk about those in in chapter uh, 22 and chapter 23. So the reversible carbonyl additions, that's chapter 22 and chapter 23, are used. The conjugate addition product is observed. So we get the one, so it's a conjugate addition or one four product. All right, so um, if you look here, we've got this. We also we have con we conjugate base, we, we have cyanide ion. And these are um, milder nucleophiles, not as strong. And if you look at this, the pKa of the conjugate acid, well, P, well, no, pKa, it's already the conjugate base. pKa of the, uh, that's what I want to say. Sorry, conjugate acid is about 9. So that could act as a leaving group. So all of these nucleophiles that do, uh, that do reversible addition, they are going to attack the carbonyl faster, but they can come back off again. And eventually, periodically, it will attack the 1, 4 position. And once it attacks the 1, 4 position, you form the most stable product, and it doesn't go backwards. So every nucleophile is going to attack the carbonyl faster. It's just that these, once they can attack, um, come right back off. Uh, the, 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 the one that's different is cuprates. Cuprates are not attacking the carbonyl, so they're going to attack 1, 4 instead. All right, so cuprates, there's our, there's our 1, 4 addition only, 1, 4 addition. Now, let's say, what, what if you had an alpha beta unsaturated acid chloride? What would, where would the cuprate attack? I don't know. Would it do carbonyl faster? Probably. 
Okay, so that would be the difference. I won't give you that problem. But most of the time, cuprates don't attack carbonyls. So questions so far, let's, and then we'll look at some examples. Anybody, questions? We're going to come back to the same reaction in chapter 22 and chapter three, 23. So let's, let's just look at some reactions here. So alpha, beta, unsaturated, um, carbonyl. So now you see where we got the name alpha, beta. We talked about those you know, when we talked about spectroscopy. So conjugated carbonyl, lithium aluminum hydride does irreversible carbonyl addition. So once it attacks the carbonyl, which is faster, it can't come back off again. So we're going to get one, two addition here. No one, four addition. And then when we add water in the second step, we're going to protonate. Product is an alcohol. So all reagents in this chapter except for cuprates are going to do one, two addition. That makes that easy. So this is one, two addition product. Cuprates, on the other hand, now remember, cuprates um, have different reactivity. I'm doing arrow pushing that really isn't correct, but it's just a way to conceptualize what's happening here. Cuprate reagents involve um, radical chemistry, so but we're not going to do that here. But it's, oh, and look what I started doing. I started attacking the carbonyl. And we don't want to attack the carbonyl because we are attacking 1,4 with cuprates. So arrow comes here from one of these carbon copper bonds, we attack at the, oh, whoa, what happened there? And then we're going to push electrons all the way up onto oxygen. We're going to make an enolate ion. We'll talk more about enolate ions when we get to chapter 23. And then when we protonate, electrons on oxygen are going to come down and we're going to grab the hydrogen from water. That is the one four addition product. Questions on one two versus one four addition? Anybody? All right, we have one more section on protecting groups and synthesis, and then we're going to do some synthesis problems here. A protecting group converts a reactive functional group into a group inert to the conditions of a desired reaction. It, it's important in synthesis because molecules of biological interest often contain multiple functional groups that can cross-react. So, um, for example, Let's say we wanted to um, do a Grignard reaction. Well, our, our desired reaction is to um, have this methyl magnesium bromide Grignard reagent attack this uh, carbonyl. All right, it wants to react with the ester. That's the plan to make this compound. Remember, it's going to add twice. We're going to make a ketone and it's going to add again. What's the problem here? Acidic hydrogen, the acid base reactions are faster. Okay, so we have an acidic hydrogen. All right, so a protecting group is going to allow us to um, make this, do this reaction by protecting that alcohol. All right, so um, let's draw what ha actually happens and then we're going to fix it. So here, let's draw this compound.
So these um, acid-base reactions vary very fast. So we get that, and what's our other product? Methane, CH4. CH4 gas, which bubbles off, and there, there's no reaction now that has happened. Because of that acidic hydrogen, we've just um, quenched our um, green yard. It's no longer there. All right, so, um, so what we can do is protect the alcohol. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of protecting groups. We're going to learn two. One in this chapter and one in chapter 21. And those are the only two that you need to know. All right, we're going to use a common alcohol protecting group as a silo ether. And this is the only silo ether that we will use. There's other silo ethers. There's trimethyl silo. This is um, tert butyl um, dimethyl silo, or TBDMS. And you can feel free to use this abbreviation, TBDMS ether. And so here's what, the, here's what it looks like. We're going to use um, TBDMS. And um, I think your book uses uh, triethylamine. And you certainly can use triethylamine. I'm just going to use pyridine instead because you're already familiar with triethylamine and there's a lot that we need to remember here. So um, this... Uh, or, or pyridine, I'm going to use pyridine only. All right, so what you're essentially doing is you're deprotonating. The, the alcohol is attacking the TBDMS, and then you're going to be deprotonating it, so it makes a siloenal ether, a silo ether. All right, so let's make our synthesis work now. So we're going to protect that alcohol. And then all the other things that we planned are going to be able to work very easily. I think your book also uses imidazole. We're going to just, just to um, make this a little bit easier for you, I'm going to use pyridine because you're used to using pyridine. Terbutyl dimethyl silo chloride, and pyridine. So we have our oxygen bonded to silica, silicon, and then we have two methyl groups. Okay, terbutyl dimethyl silo ether. Now we can do our reaction. CH3, MGBR, excess, because it's going to add twice, followed by water. Okay, got it. There's our reaction. Now we need to take that group back off again, right? We need to take that group back off again. We call that deprotecting. Here's the reagent that your book uses. Tetrabutyl ammonium uh, fluoride. Sorry about that. I got to fix that. Okay, what are we doing here? Tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. Um, or you can use um, acid. PKA has to be um, less than two, so pretty strong acid. 
So that's on the top of the next page. Trialkyl siloethers are stable from pH 2 to pH 12. Do you protect with strong acid or F minus? Why F minus? The silicon fluoride bond is the, and this should be SI here, not S. The silicon fluoride bond is one of the strongest sigma bonds known. So let's compare what happens when we add fluoride here. SIF, 139 kcals per mole. Silicon oxygen bond, 88 kcals per mole. So um, using fluoride ion is a great way to deprotect. Uh, questions on using a protecting group in synthesis? So that's our protecting group for alcohols. We're only going to use that for alcohols. In chapter 21, we're going to talk about a protecting group for ketones and aldehydes. And those are the only two we'll talk about in this class. All right, so let's do a little synthesis here. So we've done a lot of, we did a lot of synthesis last quarter, so most of this in synthetic design here, but we're already getting to the point where uh, there's many different ways to synthesize compounds. So that gives us a harder job when we're grading exams. So if you ever synthesize something and uh, you get it marked wrong and you think it's right, come up and show me and I'll, I'll tell you if it works or not. Okay? So we've got a lot of different great creative minds out here, so you guys are going to come up with your own, own ideas here. And very often a student will show me a synthesis that's actually better than the one that I've shown on the board and I like when that happens. Okay, so you guys have some great creative ideas. All right, so let's say um, synthesize the following compound from the given starting material. You can go in the forward direction or you could go in the reverse direction working backwards from the product. If you work backwards from the product, that's retrosynthetic analysis. I never make you use retrosynthetic analysis. It's a tool for you to use and it can be very helpful. When I'm grading a synthesis on the exam, I grade the synthesis in the forward direction though because um, it's difficult to grade people's thought patterns. So I, that, we try not to do that. All right, so um, what we're noticing here, and, and you want to get in the habit of counting carbons, we're actually adding a carbon here. So we're making a new carbon-carbon bond here. So since we're making a new carbon-carbon bond, you want to use carbon-carbon um, uh, bond forming strategies. So that, so that would be um, use um, carbon nucleophiles. We have a number of carbon nucleophiles. We have um, granules, organolithium. We have cuprates. We have deprotonated terminal alkynes, right? So this is why you want to have a sheet that has all your carbon-carbon bond forming strategies. We also have um, cyanide ion, right? If we, use, if we do an SN2 with cyanide ion, that also adds on a carbon. Okay, so, so think of these um, carbon, carbon nucle nucleophiles. So, uh, Grignard, organolithium, et cetera. So, we've got a lot of things to do here. So, so what I'm thinking here retrosynthetically is doing a dehydration after making, having this compound here. So use one of the carbon nucleophiles, attack the ketone, make an alcohol, and then do a dehydration. So once I have this, I would do um, H2SO4 concentrated for dehydration. And this I can make from my starting material. So, you know, when we, go, when we go backwards, you keep looking back at your starting material and you're trying to um, actually work towards that, starting from the starting material. Methyl magnesium bromide or methyl lithium. 
Okay, so here's what the synthesis in the forward direction would look like. So, the, so sometimes I will have an open-ended synthesis where I ask you to draw the products from each step, and that's what this would look like. Sometimes I have it in a box and I just have you number the steps. So I do both types. Um, if it was an open-ended synthesis where you have to fill in the uh, reagents and draw the intermediates, it would look like this. These, of course, are more difficult to grade, so um, I can't put too many of these on an exam, or we're there all day and all night grading. Okay, so Grignard attacks the carbonyl, and then we protonate, and then we just use a H2SO4 concentrated. to make our product. Questions on how I did that, anybody? So it's a little trickier now to figure out what to use. So we do have one more than one way, and, um, but now the synthesis is going to get more complicated because we're building up elaborate carbon skeletons. All right, so here we go here. I'm looking at the product and I'm going to go in reverse here. And I'm noticing, I'm counting carbons and I'm noticing that I have a new carbon-carbon bond. So I'm going to use some of the new carbon-carbon bond forming strategies that we've learned. So Grignard's, organolithiums, cuprates not as much. They're more selective in what they do. But what I'm thinking is I'm adding on a one carbon piece like we mentioned earlier. If I had this, if I had this, this compound here, which I can make from alkyl halide and lithium, if I, do, if I have that, and I add on a one carbon piece, remember we talked about two different ways to add on a one carbon piece, using formaldehyde or CO2. Those are ways to add on a one carbon piece. Both add one carbon, and I'm going to show the synthesis from both of those. Does not matter which one you use. Both add one carbon. Okay, and how do I make the uh, how, how do I make the alkyl halide? I can make that from my starting alcohol and PBr3 pyridine. All right, so I've got the plan, and now I'm going to write the synthesis in the forward direction. And I will branch off here because you can do, use both of those reagents. One's going to take one step more. That doesn't matter to me. All right, we want to convert our alkyl uh, group into alkyl halide, PBr3 pyridine. And that's one of those famous reagents that we're going to use a lot. We use a lot all year long. So that converts that into an alkyl halide. Then we write lithium here. I, I, I'm not worried about stoichiometry here. So you can just write lithium here. That's fine. So now we've had our organic lithium reagent. Could we make a Grignard instead? Absolutely. We can make a Grignard instead. Doesn't matter. Probably should make a Grignard instead, right? You seeing a problem here if we make the organolithium with CO2? We do that, we go immediately to our product with one carbon. Um, or, if we do CO2 followed by acid, um, we'd, we'd be better to use a Grignard for this method. Because remember, lithium can add to the carboxylate once you form it. So really better to use a Grignard if we're going to use that method. 
Um, and then, but that's our stopping point, so we'll talk more about that next time. Think about why you would want to use a grain yard instead with CO2.